this topic's going to be a fun one. I think this topic in particular, the concept of RevOps, I also have some preconceived notions that I want you to help me to get over as well sure. as we go through this. So as we have folks joining uh, via Zoom, we have folks joining on LinkedIn. As always, I tell people, make sure to drop in your job title and company. The main reason is it just allows Fred and I to have a much more kind of focused conversation. You know, if we've got more senior leaders, if we've got more senior leaders, if we have more frontline people who are trying to figure out, again, how do we make the most out of it, we can try to, you know, kind of finagle the conversation one way or the other. So again, if you're joining on LinkedIn, if you're joining from uh, Zoom, please just drop into the chat or comments your job title, company. Uh, let's see, we've got some folks joining. Oh, we've got Jacqueline Farmer. What's going on, Jackie? How are you? Long time no chat. Dana, what's up, Dana? JP, a lot of folks here, a lot of folks I'm familiar with, which is great. We're glad to have you. Um, all right, we've got Dan. Dan, how are you? CSO at Hub Tech. All right, again, I'm paying attention to the chat. I know you're like, oh my gosh, it's a Monday. I've got to put my name out there. You know, Fred, people get nervous at these. You know, it's like, I don't want to, I just want to lurk. Right. I want to lurk. I don't want to, I don't want people to know I'm actually here, even though it's, you know, it's in the participants I can see, but I think um, I'd be a lurker if it were me. So I, I empathize with that. Most people are lurkers. Right. Uh, and then on LinkedIn, even if you just toss a, you know, again, we love questions as well. We're, we're definitely going to take some questions from the audience about this topic. So um, feel free to drop questions with you on the zoom. You can drop them in the Q and a, I'll be monitoring that. If you're on LinkedIn, um, you, know, you can just drop it in the comments as well. And so the topic for today um, that we're going to be getting into is, I don't know, I mean, we're talking about sales ops and rev ops. And I think, but we'll also try to talk about, you know, at least from my side, Fred, just some of the, the nuances and intersections between the two, maybe even a little of history of this whole concept of rev ops. Um, I think it could just be kind of like an interesting thing for us to go through. But, but again, I think sales ops and rev ops sometimes for a lot of people who are CSOs or even frontline contributors or growing leaders, I think it's one of those things where people's eyes just glaze over immediately. They're like sales operations, you know, like, oh gosh, rev ops. Oh, that's like a bunch of, you know, Excel spreadsheets and, you know, reports in Tableau or Insight Squared or, you know, et cetera. So I think our goal today will be to talk about really, you know, one, how to think about performance and how to use these different functions to drive performance. Um, when you should start to think about ramping this group, which I know a lot of people uh, struggle with, misconceptions that people have around sales ops, and then how do you tie kind of a direct correlation between operations related tasks and um, different things that they're working on, you know, decrease sales cycle, um, deal desk management, reduce admin task efficiency, et cetera. Um, so yeah, we're going to cover all the things today, all the things today. So Fred, and I'm excited to do it with you, Fred. I've known Fred since I very first started scaled Fred. I don't know if you remember this or not. It would have been like, early spring, late winter, or I'm sorry, like, yeah, like early spring of 2013, we met in Boston. I don't know. You were like literally one of the first sales calls that I did for scaled literally, gosh, eight years ago. I don't think I remember this call. I remember, I remember partnering with partnership. You. Yeah. That was I later. That, but I don't remember the first sales. Oh, no, I came into your old, you, had a, you guys had an office in a small brick building. It might even have been like half of one office. Okay. Um, it was in Cambridge? Yeah, it was in Cambridge. Okay. Yeah, it was a small office. I mean, gosh, I don't know. Maybe there's 15 people there, 20 20. Um, and I definitely pitched you on helping to optimize your sales work. I probably sounded horrible at the time because I was trying to figure it out too. So I've known Fred for eight years and watched Insight Squared. We're a partner of Insight Squared and, um, you know, especially the evolution of the platform, I think is really, you know, an organization or something that a lot of, you know, organizations, you know, should really be looking at. So Fred, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of the plugs uh, for, for this. So it's, it's easy for me. Um, so, so let's start, let's just dive in a little bit and maybe just tell, you know, for, for you in particular, like what are some of the misconceptions, you know, of what, you know, RevOps, it's overlaps with sales ops. How do you think about these two things working together? And maybe we take it that way and then misconceptions, but how do yeah. you see this kind of evolution of sales ops, rev ops, and what are maybe some of the misconceptions that you see? Yeah, the, the overlaps an interesting way to think about it. I, I, I would say more like the difference between a sales ops mentality or like a sort of uh, functional oriented mentality and a rev ops mentality is really about being cross-functional, number one. Uh, and RevOps is 
rather than focused around you know one part, it's focused on the entire goal. So uh, actually, there's this book called The Goal. Uh, my buddy. Oh Matt, yes. You know, yeah, I'm yes. going there. I'm sorry. Do you know? I you love know, the you, goal. You know, you know Matt Cameron from Sassy Sales. Yeah, yeah, Matt, yeah, Matt and I are buddies. So okay, so he introduced me to this book. And uh, I, I love it for a lot of reasons. Uh, I give a lot of book recommendations. I, I apologize in advance, but I love it for a lot of reasons. One is it's set in a different industry, right? It's about like it's a it's about a factory. Um, and one of my beliefs is there's a lot more similarities than there are differences between people, between businesses, between industries. And uh, the this author Eliyahu Goldratt is his name. That's right. Talks about the theory of constraints. So. One of the reasons I love this book is I think there's a lot of factory operations management mentality that can and now is being applied to sales. Like sales is going from being this, you know, black box artisanal to like being a, a much yes. more uh, structured, managed. Uh, so I, I, that's a big transformation that's happening. The other th reason I really love this book is it focuses on one particular thing. So the goal is is, is singular. Uh, the goal of any business is to generate profit. So like RevOps is, is not around generating leads or closing deals or, or, or securing renewals. It's about thinking about everything cross-functionally and, and holistically. Um, so I think that, that that's, that's like a fundamental difference of mentality. That being said, again, back to the factory uh, metaphor, like you can't cross-train everyone for everything. So if you try to do that, then you're going to have, you know, jack of all trades uh, versus, you know, deep specialists. So I think where the, where, where the difference exists is uh, like for, for us and our RevOps team, you know, we have different ownership of different systems. Those do tend to organize around departments. So like right. we, have, we have someone who focuses on the sales part, part of the process. We have someone who focuses on the marketing part of the process, but all of us have RevOps in our title. All of us meet and there is some element of cross-training. And what we realize is there are very few projects. There are some, like for example, you know, a CPQ system, right? That, that, that that's really that that's you know, marketing is not as interested in in the, in the CPQ system typically. Although even there, I can draw some cross-functional parallels, right? Can. Like, is the messaging right in the proposals? Are we aligned cross-functionally? Um, so everyone on our team has RevOps in the title, and I think it's as much about the the sort of the mindset as it is around uh, the org structure. Do you think part of it though is like, you know, it maybe is more all encompassing sales ops back when salespeople did all the same thing, right? Like whenever sales teams were and kind of what I've seen is that the big reason for rev ops existing is as we specialized all these roles, we lost track of the holistic picture. And it's really just, I mean, I feel like, you know, we had business operations in the past, but I, this concept of rev ops, I feel like is, you know, newer because people, you know, from what I see Fred have just realized they've lost touch you know, that everything is operating in such a silo. And then, you know, there's customer success operations, which I think is probably one of the most underrated, you know, kind of growth functions that you could add that people just are sleeping on hardcore because it's not- I think just under put up biz ops, like I think naming matters kind of like, you know, you put together a comp plan as like a direction of what you want people to do. The name matters, like biz ops feels like a back office, mm -hmm. uh, you know, reporting type of a function, you know, are, are we trying to save costs and then cut, cut some process out versus revenue ops is all around, uh, you know, generating more revenue. Uh, so I think I think that that is that's another big part of the shift from this you know biz ops, which can be cross functional, but I think more often than not sits in finance and is oriented around you know risk management and uh, you know cost cutting and that kind of thing. Versus revenue ops is really there to directly partner with sales, like sales, and I use sales in the broader sense to include customer success and marketing. In that, it's all around uh, that the, the goal of the business. Okay. And so when we talk about kind of, again, let's, we'll, we'll focus a little bit on like sales ops and rev ops. Do you feel, you know, do, do you usually start with one? I mean, again, cause I guess it's you know, early on, you're not doing that. You know, like when would you start to, if you're an early stage company, um, when do you think about being ready to hire, whether it's maybe it's first sales ops, then it's rev ops, but you know, whenever you're working with companies that are best in class at Insight Squared, how have you think of, how have you seen them think about the support and operations roles as they've, they've scaled. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting. I, I do think early on folks go with one or the other, like, do we, do we focus on marketing ops? Do we focus on sales ops? And, and they, they hire someone wherever the need is most acute. 
But then what we typically see, and we, we had this, certainly when you and I met, we had this, we had marketing ops first and marketing ops own Salesforce. So were they really marketing ops or were they really cross-functional? So um, I, what, what I tend to see is, uh, you know, people hire wherever the need is greatest. So wherever the pain is, is most, but really that early hire is a generalist. They, they have to be until you can you know, build a team. Yeah. So a generalist, not a Salesforce admin. Okay. Everyone listen very closely. Revenue ops and sales, sales operations in particular is not a Salesforce admin. That so, is a so very, not a, re, not a report creator. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's dive into that. Cause I think that's it. And, and then I think we'll kind of, we'll, we'll go to rev ops too, which is what do you, okay, cause I think sales ops, it was kind of like the initial genesis of what, what has become rev ops, or maybe it's kind of a biz ops sales ops yep. you know, brainchild here. Um, what goes in, what do you see best in class sales operations teams doing? You know, like what, like what goes into great? Because again, I do think Fred so often, yeah, especially, you know, we talk to companies and we obviously do a lot of sales operations as a service work. You know, it's like, you know, we need some reports and dashboards. Uh, I need to make sure that we've got required fields at each step and, and make sure some of these tools integrate, you know, to where I can get my more data to track activities, right? Yep. That is, <laughs> that simplification is what I see of a lot of sales ops, but what does best in class look like to you? How are, how are best in class companies using sales operations strategically? Yeah, I mean, so so I think best in class, so I'll start from the beginning and then go to best in class. I think it depends on on where you are in your evolution and also how much research, like how far behind are you, right? So if you wait too long to hire ops, uh, ops is going to be super reactive where, you know, you, you hire one person and there's, you know, five person, uh, five people worth of work to do. All they're going to be doing is fielding requests and those requests tend to be reports. Uh, so that's sort of the very reactive, like, hey, I need, I need a field added to Salesforce. This thing doesn't work. Do this. They're order takers. Um, I think at the other end of the extreme, uh, so, you know, I think there's sort of like three, three categories of, of work that I think a proactive uh, ops function does. So one is like identify areas where friction exists, like what, what's slowing us down uh, and back to back to that, like understanding what the bottleneck is. So um, yes. I, hate that, I hate that I keep going back to this now, but, you know, uh, please, Fred, you don't understand my obsession with goal. I, so, by, by the way, everybody, I dropped the Amazon link in the chat. You have go by the goal. It's, it's required. By, yeah, I got my MBA. It's like required reading, but it's the most interesting book about logistics. It's like, imagine it's a logistics book told in fiction. Like yeah, that's there, the there, best way to describe it. So it's there, like, it's quasi interesting. Yeah. Just on that point, there are a couple of books that I've read that are told in this sort of parable uh, style. Another one is another great book. It's called Leadership and Self-Deception. Um, and it's this like, you know, 200 page story that you could summarize in three bullets, but unless you read the 200 pages, you won't really internalize it. So like you have to go through the pain of reading the parable uh, and then you really <laughs> internalize yeah, it. Yeah, five dysfunctions so, of a team is, is another one that I, I think. I, 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 I know the table group, I haven't read, read that yeah. book. Uh, actually, no, I have read that book. Um, so one of the things that's like a pet peeve of mine is when someone says, look, so here are five bottlenecks. And I'm like, no, 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 you have one bottleneck. That's, it's in the it's in the definition of the word. Like, look it up in the dictionary. So, what what is the, the the constraint in your business, and what is the thing that's slowing you down? So, I think one thing that a proactive RevOps uh, team uh, can do is identify what what are, what are the gaps. Like, are, are we so for us, for example, um, I'll get, I'll tell a story of what happened with us. So, uh, I'm sure we're not unique in this. You know, end of the month, end of the quarter. Uh, we thought we had a deal ready to go. Our buyer is ready to sign. Uh, and then legal's like, wait a second, you know, we've got a whole, you know, redlining <laughs> process. And the underlying reason for that was, you know, our, our team didn't want to proactively introduce, uh, you know, something that, that could take a bunch of time and add a bunch of risk and, and better sort of like stick your, you know, not stick your head in the sand, but like avoid it because you know what, half or three quarters of the time, maybe they were fine. Um, we identified that as, as a bottleneck. It's also not fun, you know, staying up at 11 p.m. Uh, doing West Coast, uh, you know, deal negotiation. And now, you know, we have an MSA that we front load into the process. You know, another example, we, we, we got the same requests, you know, five times over, 10 times over. Why don't you just bake that into your, into your core uh, MSA to reduce the friction? So like that kind of friction reduction, I think is, is one uh, key element. The other part that I think, 
and this is where the partnership with sales comes in, it's not just about setting up the systems. Like what I see in best in class RevOps teams is they're in the forecast meeting, they're in the they're in the, the weekly sales meetings, and they're helping to drive executions. Like, hey, look, we, we have a we have an SLA with marketing. You know, we respond to leads within four hours. Here, here are the you know, 50% of leads that didn't get a response in four hours last week. What's going on? And enabling those hard discussions, like if everything's going great, there's nothing to talk about, right? Like if, if uh, it's, it's where you want, you want to focus on the areas for improvement because you want to continue to drive further and further growth. So I think driving execution is another one. And then I think the other one is, you know, identifying changes that need to be made. Like, uh, you know, I, I've, I've sat now, now this is the real luxury. I, you know, I have, I have four hours on my calendar. Who has that? I have four hours on my calendar. I've spent a lot of time digging into the data and, I've identified that, um, you know, if we don't have five meetings in the first 30 days of a deal, we don't win deals. Let's take that understanding, overlay that on, on, on our current pipeline, and then, uh, you know, start changing our behavior. So you use, use historical evidence to change future behavior. Um, and then, you know, you're done with that. What's the next bottleneck? Yeah. Okay. So, so just to kind of take a step back, the interesting part and why the goal is such a good book is what Fred described, my friends, is kind of how you tackle almost any workflow problem, right? And the, the reason to me, at least the goal is so transformative is you can apply that to just thinking about your customer journey and how do we reduce friction with the bottlenecks, which is kind of what Fred's doing, you know, from more of a, the other side of it, which is, you know, the best way that we can do it on sales. It applies to, um, uh, internal workflows that you have and handoffs between groups. Um, this whole concept of the theory of constraints, which is to map your systems and processes, identify the the one bottleneck that if by if by fixing, I then unlock X more you know flow. And I always think of it as I've drawn this a million times. It's like imagine a pipe, right? That has some things that are thick some things that are skinny and they're all blocking different water flow. And so it's like, you just go to where the water flow is being constricted, you know, or thinking about when I remove this bottleneck, okay, what's going to do it here. And actually I should remove this bottleneck down here because that actually will equal more flow, even though it looks like this is the, um, you know, the, 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 the blocker. And so I think for a lot of you, again, if you're trying to make this more strategic, what I like about the other thing you said too, Fred, is that, RevOps and, or if you don't have RevOps yet, sales ops needs a seat at the table to provide insights that we should be empowering sales ops and RevOps to provide insights. And then to your point, get tactical with the changes, you know, and get tactical with, um, you know, how we actually execute. And so, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a twin to this question that maybe Fred for you is how do you see these groups working together with RevOps? Because, you know, from my vantage point at first, what I feel like is that we created all these new ops roles. These didn't used to exist, right? And then we're like, you know, what we need is an ops role for the ops roles, right? Because we everything got so siloed. And so, you know, how do you see this kind of new world? And then you've got leadership with their own opinions and being compensated differently. So you've got all these different worlds. Um, how do you see these teams working together, whether it's marketing ops and rev ops, sales ops, rev ops, customer success ops, how, how do they best all work together? Well, I think eventually, and this is the evolution, uh, they'll all be one group. The question is, are you ready to have that? It's just sort of like, you, you, you know, you have the chief customer officer, right? And the chief customer officer is the single point responsible for, you know, marketing, sales, and customer success. Um, you know, I, I've, I've, I've asked, you know, Nick, Nick Meadow over, over at Gainsight, and we've talked about this in the past where it's like, you know, everything you're talking about in customer success needs to be integrated earlier on so that you sell sustainable deals. And ultimately, I think what Gainsight is doing and what, what they espouse is really a new way of doing sales, period. So I think ultimately, I, I think of RevOps as the next generation of how you organize operations uh, paired directly with the revenue organization. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that that can happen overnight. There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of reasons why we may want to have certain kinds of organizational structure. Uh, some of them may be political. 
Some of them may be the skill sets that you have. I mean, uh, we're human beings. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, what's the joke? How do, you, how do you define politics? Two people in a room. So um, it doesn't have to be an organizational structure. I think going back to what I said before, it starts with that cross-functional mentality. Uh, like people used to say, you know, the lines between, for example, sales and marketing are blurring. I think those lines are gone. So if you're an organization that doesn't understand the fact that those lines are gone, I think you're 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 not going to be you're not going to be very competitive in the market where an, where there's an organization that does see that, that those lines are gone. So right now it might be a cross-functional mentality where you have marketing ops and sales ops. Certainly, the larger the organization, the harder it is to change, uh, you know, org structure. So I think we're seeing RevOps centralizing operations in in smaller, certainly in in high growth startups, uh, where oftentimes I think, you know, high growth, especially venture backed startups, are on the leading edge of you know using technology, using yep. new uh, using new concepts. Uh, using new org structures because they have such pressure and this imperative for growth. Um, so they're the ones, they're the early adopters. Uh, but over time, I think even this will, this will push further and further into the enterprise as being the org structure. But if you don't have the formal reporting lines, I think it's about, you know, creating cross-functional, like, is there, a, is there a meeting where we talk about the whole uh, production line end to end, not just my station? Do you see that then? Do you think that, I mean, do you see sales ops or marketing ops rolling into rev ops or kind of to your maybe, and it's probably is the answer is it can, it can work both ways, but is there a best in class, you know, a better way where as opposed to rolling into their section and then dotted lining in, um, cause I could see advantages to both. I could definitely see advantages to both. Yeah, I, I think, again, it depends on the scale of the organization. Um, you know, we, we, for example, and a lot of our customers, uh, we, they, they do have consolidated revenue operations. And they're, they sort of sit parallel to the revenue organization, and they look at the entire flow end to end. Um, so I, I, that, that, you know, five, 10 years from now, I, I think this will be less of a debate. In the interim, I think it's much more about the culture than it is about, uh, you know, do, do, you, yeah. do, do you have cross-functional barriers? Do things have to go up the, you know, if there's an issue between sales and marketing, uh, does it have to go up, up the chain to executive leadership to get resolved? If so, if so, you're going to be operating much more slowly. Yeah, as opposed to, again, can RevOps, and again, if they are living in different groups, can RevOps help to surface some of these and then partner with their counterparts in marketing operations and sales operations to unclog these things, exactly. right? And to, and to create, or if they're all reporting together, then RevOps gets the ability to do that more freely. Um, yeah, and with, I think with specialists. So you may have you know, a RevOps team, a marketing ops team, and a sales ops team, and a customer success ops team uh, within them. And maybe some folks are cross-functional, shared across, because the, a lot of the systems you know, tie together across the board. Yeah. And it was, John just, John just uh, dropped a question here on LinkedIn that I think is an important one. How do you... Someone's ringing my doorbell. Hopefully my wife will grab it. Uh, how do you? I'm waiting talk, for one of my kids to run in, so don't talk worry. Talk to yeah. So how do you talk to clients? Because again, I, by the way, I love this. I'm totally going to steal this for a post idea, Fred. Uh, the lines aren't blurring; they're gone. Um, I think that we're moving there, but but how do you deal with this right now? So like, let's say this sounds great. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are listening to us and are like, makes sense logically. Reality land is you've got comp issues, meaning this group's only compensated on this part, this group's comped on this part, and nobody's compensated on this, right? Even a chief commercial officer sometimes doesn't have some of those pieces. You know, are there things that you see, um, like, or maybe it's just ways to articulate this shift, right? It's, it's really John's question. Um, or, you know, how, how do you see companies that might still have these barriers taking them down in a way that is as less at the least political as possible way to take these barriers down. Yeah. So if it's a non-starter to consolidate these groups or maybe a non-starter right now, um, I think creating a forum for that cross-functional interaction is critical. So do the teams even, so I've interacted with customers where the teams don't even get together. And it's like, you know, we're just going to, you know, pass leads over the transom. We sign a deal. Good luck with that. Um, 
<clears throat> so I, I think creating a venue for cross-functional collaboration, you know, is there an opportunity, even if the groups are separate, to create a cross-functional roadmap? Uh, it's a whole other conversation about how to how to run uh, revenue operations. Like we, we run RevOps fully agile. Uh, in fact, you know, we spend time with our software development team and uh, we implemented as much as possible from the process that they run in our RevOps team, which creates, uh, I think, you know, great flow of work. Again, back to this thing, like everything is the same. Uh, you know, the, the way that, that you produce innovative software and the way that you produce innovative, innovative operations, you know, can use the same systems. And part of those systems encourage you know, a high degree of transparency, accountability, um, and 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 cross-functional collaboration. So I think you could use you know uh, venues, forums to create that visibility, and then tools and systems and, and processes um, to create transparency and create accountability as well. Yeah, I, I think that, that that to me feels like a very approachable step one, right? A very approachable step one for anyone who's looking to do this is just have a cross-functional meeting and start to think about, is there a KPI or, you know, one, maybe two KPIs? That's another another fun fact for you too, Fred, around um, the theory of constraints is, do you know that the word priorities wasn't invented until the 1920s? Like, like it used to just be- Singular. Priority, because <laughs> you can't have priorities. You can have one priority and then sure. management, you know, management started and management consulting started and we started to dream up new. Well, no, you can have lots of priorities, yeah, but, there, but I think- <laughs> Yeah, there's no such thing for human brain. There's, there's no such thing as multitasking. There's only context switching. Uh, so um, yeah, you can, you, your brain cannot think about two things at once and context switching is really expensive. Yes, and, and I think that that is the COVID world, um, like time management gap that I think all of us as leaders have tried to solve is how do we help people? And how do we not overload with priorities? Um, but which actually goes into this idea too. So I want to go, I want to kind of maybe dig into sales ops a little bit um, as a part of this, because I think there's a lot of people here, maybe sales ops is, or, or marketing ops is what they're kind of most familiar with. Um, when you, when you think about sales operations, um, are there, and you think about maybe it, it could be around the tools that you look at as too, as well, Fred, are there areas within sales operations that you feel like many companies um, or are there, are there, maybe there's piece data points, et cetera, that companies just consistently miss that sales operations could be unlocking. So if they're not going to do dashboards, they're not just going to do reports. Are there typical, are there like insights that you see consistently that sales operations is surfacing, or maybe it's around the deal structure and it could be rev ops too, that are actually improving reps ability to sell. How do you prove it? Right? Like what are the things or the insights you see that typically they focus on this metric and then they can prove some type of lift? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, ultimately, if you think, think about like what sales ops is, it, it, it is it, to, we're, we're overhead in the process, right? Like any, to that, to that, by that rule, anyone who's not carrying quota is, is overhead in the, uh, in the revenue generating process, sure. right? So like the question is, maybe I turn your question around a little bit, like, go for it. Uh, can I, create value measured in units of, of sales that are vastly in excess of my cost to the organization. So that, that, that's the question. So like, you know, we were talking about earlier about like, you know, when, when companies bring, bring uh, ops in and, and what, what flavor it is, um, you know, you bring up, like you, you bring ops in when you think that you can make a meaningful improvement. So like if we squeeze 10% more uh, bookings out of the team this year, uh, how, how much of that, you know, do we want to carve up to, in cost to do that? Because you have to invest to get the return. Uh, so there's a certain scale below which it just doesn't make sense to invest unless you, you know, unless you're planning to, you know, plan investing, you know, way ahead of of, of where you are. Yeah. Um, and then as far as you know, what are the types of things where where you can make like a meaningful improvement? Um, you know, I'll give, give an example that that we see a lot, and that's. Um, Looking at looking at those past uh, trends and overlaying them on on existing pipelines. So, like, what what we see is almost always. Uh, so, time is our most scarce resource, and there are two things that happen. One is our sellers aren't spending enough time selling. So, like, how says can you, most teams, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it says you know a, a bunch of research. So, I actually before this call, I remembered some stats. 
and uh, I asked uh, I asked some some on the team to help me find them, and it's like sad. It's like somewhere between twenty and fifty percent of sales time is actually spent engaging with customers, and yet when we look, and this is empirically across all of our customers, this this, should, this is sort of an obvious statement, but like the the tightest correlation between outcomes is the frequency and volume of interaction with your customers. <laughs> right. Sounds sounds like really obvious. Like if you talk right. to people, you're more likely to figure out. Uh, whether or not there's a solution that, that, that merits them doing business with you. Um, and our, our teams aren't spending enough time doing that. And uh, they're spending time on deals that they don't have a, a, a chance of winning. So I think th those, those are the two areas where if I think about like where I could, for, as, a, as a sales ops, rev ops professional, really move the needle for an organization is, is those two categories. Can we give them time back to talk to customers and can we get them on the phone with the right people or get them, get them on the phone in, in person over Zoom with the right people? Why do you think we struggle with this, Fred? It's intuitive. We know it. It's the data shows it. We know it. <clears throat> but why do you feel like in many organizations, the concept of time, I, I feel like the concept, well, I, this is just a, we've just seen this across kind of consultants that a time savings based value prop is one of the most difficult to solve because the human brain doesn't like to quantify it of like, how do we actually do it? I'm going to save you 50 cents or give you 40. They're like, give me the 40. Like we want, we like gains and yeah, time remember, saving in particular. I remember in business school, we did this negotiation uh, experiment and essentially proving that, that, that human beings are, 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 are very, uh, yeah. So we, we, we want it, we want gains. We don't, we don't want to think about the losses. Um, so my question, question was, the question was, Wow. How do you, how do you start an organization or, or is there a way that you can quantify this differently to show not just, Hey, you know, we're only spending 30% of our times, 40% of our, you know, we're spending, sorry, we're spending 30% of our time on 40%. You know, we need to invest in sales operations. Is there, are there data, other data points that teams could look at or that you've seen sales ops or revit seems that have been do you mean to, focused? to justify the need? Yeah, to justify the need and the continued investment and, and reasons more and more why RevOps and sales ops needs to be a more strategic part of the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, think, I don't think that's the rate limiting factor. Like we, we've seen and we, we've talked about this for years and, and the, the team at, at Forrester has put stats around like the, the, the massive like triple digit growth year over year for maybe five, six years now of uh, revenue operations titles. So I, I don't think that that... Um, maybe within a specific organization, you, you're having a hard time c convincing, but I think as an industry, as a whole, we're moving in this direction. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, I, I want to be careful not to make this about Insight Squared, but I think a, a big challenge has been, you know, the, the, the tech hasn't been there. Like we just haven't had the visibility. So I, I spent 10 years uh, telling people, if you manage to dashboards, you know, people are going to, people are going to change their behavior. I used to, I used to give this spiel about like, you know, if you get a really good scorecard, you're going to enable a rep to be a mini CEO of his or her own franchise and reverse engineer the W-2 and all that. And like the, the, the reality is all of our systems historically have been uh, based off of this need for reps to input data into a system. And, and that has a number of challenges associated with it. Like think about the digital marketing revolution that happened, you know, essentially started two decades ago, right? So we went from saying, I know half my marketing works, not just not which half, to saying I can observe every single interaction my prospect has digitally with my website and other properties and correlate that into results and actually do ROI and campaigns, like mind blowing, right? Um, sales kind of lagged that. Yeah, and, and we still said, you know, great. Like, we're, you know, the 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 beatings will proceed until morale improves with right. regard to CRM hygiene, and like, it just doesn't it just doesn't work. Uh, I remember uh, we had this really fun infographic. Uh, Joe Chernoff, who was our CMO at the time, put together this image of a manager beating a rep with a carrot. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> like it. it yeah, this, that's interesting. Like, ultimately, there's, there's like. You know, whether it's, you know, punt the carrot or the stick uh, or hitting people with a carrot, uh, like there's just nothing in it for the reps to do this stuff, much like there's nothing in it for customers to tell the marketers, you know, why they came to the car dealership. Like you just have to, you know, follow the digital breadcrumbs. 
And now, you know, we're starting to see a, a set of technologies that, that help sales follow the digital breadcrumbs. So you could answer these questions that were previously unanswerable. Yeah. And I think, I think that, that that'll be a good kind of spot for us. We'll go for another like 10 or 15, but I think that's where I want to go next. And, and we had a question here from Nicole Lusk. And I think Nicole actually maybe just asked the, the question in a more succinct way than I did, which was around, I'm trying to set OKRs for next quarter. And how can I measure the time we give back? Right. That's, that's really a lot of the questions, which is, okay, so I get intuitively there's time savings. What instead of the metrics that I could measure that would, yeah, that, that that's, would yeah, that's decrease, great. that would show that time savings? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, me, me, ultimately we're, we're talking about measuring activity. Um, so I think best in class organizations, uh, it's it's very uh, to some extent it feels mundane. We're not talking about like high level strategies and and, and positioning. It's just really simple. Like, hey, did, did did you send fifty emails last week? Did you did you were you, were you on the phone for for four hours you know a day or, or or what have you? And I think COVID has been you know this this pandemic has been an in, in, incredible social experiment where you know folks that were in the field and previously un, unmeasurable. Uh, in terms of their activity are now over Zoom and using systems where they are creating these digital breadcrumbs, and now we can, we can measure it. So I think best-in-class organizations, and this goes back to what I was saying, like how RevOps can support, they do this like, incessantly. Like every Monday, we, we, we look at the metrics, like, you know, how, we, how do we generate, how are we on, on meeting scheduled? How are we on, you know, late-stage pipeline creation relative to our own benchmarks, you know? Same time last year, trending directly month over month, quarter over quarter. Um, so I think that that's where you can sort of inversely measure it. So you, you can make an assumption that if your sellers are engaged with, with, with their customers more, their prospects more, uh, you've created a time savings. I, I, I start with this belief that you know, everyone's, uh, everyone's trying to the best of their abilities and has good, good intentions and is working hard. So if they're doing that and they're not meet, meeting certain uh, requirements for customer facing activity, it's because you've made the system too hard for them to operate. So I think you can sort of measure the inverse. If what you're doing has a positive impact on their customer facing activity, um, and now you can measure you know, time on meetings, uh, you can even, you can, you can measure who's talking more. Is it Jake talking more, Fred talking more? Um, and you can look at these in aggregate on a, on a weekly basis. And I think that's where you should see signs of improvement if you're giving them back time. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll just say maybe some other ones and OKR, right. Is, you know, it's quarterly many times it's quarterly. So it can be uh, maybe not as much the, the two other ones that I think you can track to, if you're an enablement leader or operations is average sales cycle, right? Great. Our sales cycle for this type of deal is typically 35 days by making this change to efficiency or, you know, what we're doing again, like Fred and like that analogy he had very early, if you all heard where he talked about how they by start parallel path into procurement at step two, they then could shrink the sales cycle late. So I love, and then with using a tool like Insight Squared, it, it's not only can you look at that at the the global level, which sometimes hides a lot of trends. You can also look at that at the team level and the rep level. And you'll see that reps all have their own issues. So it's like, you know, Nicole, even if you want to do an OKR around working with one team, imagine a world where you could say, look, I'm going to work to shrink our late stage deal cycle. The other would, that I would think about that you could think if you're looking for an OKR would be conversion percentage. I want to see if by doing this, I can increase conversion percentage from stage two to stage three or stage three to stage four. So that kind of average age and stage and sales cycle holistically basically broken down or the conversion, not looking at holistic, just close rate from beginning to end, but that mid funnel conversion rate, I think are, could be two like really interesting OKRs. Yeah, you know, I like that last one uh, because it, it kind of goes back to the, that constraints, right? It's like uh, the other way to think about constraints is uh, diminishing returns, right? So like if you're converting 95%, like let's say you have like a fulfillment stage where, where you, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with procurement or whatever. If you're converting 95% of those deals to closed one, um, you're probably really far on the path of diminishing returns. So the ability to move the needle for your business on that's probably low versus if, you know, early on you're dropping. So we, so we had an issue. So James Davison, who's, who's our uh, chief product officer, uh, was looking at our data and identified, you know, for a segment of our business, substantial drop off in between stage one and stage two. So really early, early on. And, you know, 
you can move the needle a lot more. We we're way down further on the path of that's, this is a euphemism of saying, you know, we, we, we needed to execute better. We're way down on the path of diminishing returns in that area. Uh, he went in, and to your point about being tactical, like he went in, listened to, I don't know, 50, 60 calls recorded, uh, looked at the, at the metadata and the analytics, identified a change in our positioning, uh, doubled the rate of conversion. So all things being equal, uh, you can move the needle a lot more there than you can somewhere where, where you're already, you know, high conversion. So I, I like that as, as a focus. You just have to use the analytics to pick the right, the right area to focus on and, and assume, you know, believe that's the bottleneck for the business. All right. So this gets into kind of our last section here. And Dean, Dean has a question here too. I'm going to try to distill it down. You know, one of his is more around, you know, because now, you know, with, with the, the, with Insight Squared, you're measuring, you know, the impact of all these different things and, and what they have, you know, the, I think for a long time, the moniker for sales is more, right? More activities, right? If we need more deals, we need more of this. It's just the answer is I just, I just keep beating the more button with the carrot and saying, you know, just, just, you know, let's do a spiff for, you know, Johnny who made 500 calls this, you know, the last two days. So, but, but are there data points that you're seeing, um, you know, about this kind of bleed between marketing and sales, are there any kind of interesting data points that you all have seen around correlations to either it's deals closing faster or, um, you know, deals, just more deals closing? Are there other, are there kind of engagement factors other than just like at the top of the funnel, other than just more? Yeah. So uh, again, when I, when I tell this to you, I think it's going to sound obvious, except for, you know, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's not obvious. Uh, you know, someone, I remember someone used to always say common sense is not so common. Um, and, you know, part of the challenge is that people don't have access to the data. So one of the things we've seen, and again, this is empirically, is when we, when we hook up and when we really start to capture all the, act essentially observe all of the activity where it happens naturally, we measure 10x the amount of activity that exists in the CRM. So I'll tell you an embarrassing story. So I remember sitting in, this was like way back, probably around the time we met and we were, we were raising a round of funding and I was talking to an investor and he was like, well, why doesn't your system just tell me what to do? Like, okay, you, you're giving me some like great, you know, some, some great, some great like pipeline coverage conversion rates is great, but like, tell me what to do. And I was like, well, we can't like, th there's no statistical model, no machine learning I could apply to data that's so thin and data that's human generated. So as a result, these obvious insights around engagement uh, just weren't weren't accessible. So here, here's an obvious uh, here's an obvious uh, indicator of, of success: um, whether or not someone responds to your email. Okay, the sound that sounds like really trivial, right? So Jacob, if, if it's it's almost end of the quarter, if I've got a deal with you in my commit, and you haven't responded to me in two weeks the deal's not coming in. And what we find when we, again, when we apply these insights to a customer's pipeline is that a lot of where they're spending their time fits the pattern of deals that aren't going to be successful. And it's for the exact reason you said more, like, uh, you know, if you tell people to generate more pipeline, they'll generate more pipeline. They won't necessarily, or if you tell them you want a certain inventory of pipeline that they manage, they will have a certain inventory of a pipeline they manage it might not be the good kind it may not, be, not lead to the results right, but want. it's what you wanted to see on a sheet so yeah so again like the number one in indicator and like we're, we're social beings we're we're, we're, we're humans so it's, again it's pretty obvious number one indicator of of success or failure in a deal is some form of of, of engagement you know you're showing up to meetings you're taking my calls so you respond to my emails um and what's so while that in and of itself is obvious What's not obvious is what's the threshold. So very typically we see these sort of points of inflection after which win rates start going up. So for Insight Squared, it's five meetings within 30 days. This is for our own sales team. If we don't have five meetings, and by the way, these aren't just like, these are meetings where the customer has accepted a meeting. So if they decline the meeting five minutes before a meeting, I hate when people do that, um, that doesn't count. So this is like, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty good proxy for did the meeting happen? Um, if we don't have five meetings within 30 days, uh, much lower win rate than if, that, than if we have five, six, or seven, and the win rate starts increasing. So you take an insight, and by the way, that's different for every organization. So while the concept is obvious and ubiquitous, like what's your inflection point? It might be different than mine. 
it might be different for two teams to your point exactly about, right like, okr specific like if you sell commercial and enterprise uh you know they have different properties different sales cycles different needs so you really have to understand like what are the meaningful parts of your business across which you want to look at this um when you find those insights that are specific to you and then you apply them to your active engagements uh typically people don't love what they see initially uh because it's a stark <laughs> reminder that <laughs> like uh that's not what we had been tracking yeah, but, all along. But then, but then what do you, back to the point about saving time, what do you do is you close out all the stuff that's not going to happen. And now you've got a bunch of time. Now, what are you going to do with that time? You know, do activities uh, that, that will yield to the results that you want. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to build on this Dean, <laughs> Dean for your question. And John, you chimed in is, so if the answer is not the more button, and, and I'm going to parallel this actually with a a piece of data that Gong put out, maybe, I think it was a, maybe, a, a, it wasn't quite a year ago, but it's probably like nine months ago. So imagine what, what Fred's saying is that it's about getting engagement and responses. So imagine rep one, and I'm not saying that this is the answer, I'm just trying to make a more tactical parallel if someone's out there thinking about this. Rep one is all their messaging's call to actions. Hey, book a meeting, book a meeting, book a meeting. Hey, hey, Bob, pitch, pitch, pitch. Gong did a report that actually found that the most popular call to action was not a date and time anymore. It was, is it okay if I send you more details on blah, 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 whatever the thing was. And it was very hyper-personalized. That was almost a double the positive reply rate. And so to kind of take this a step further, it's that, well, maybe the answer isn't that you're doing more activities that are about call to action, call to action. You're doing more activities to get that first positive reply to then get the second, third, fourth, fifth. And that to me is what a true revenue intelligence platform is going to help me to understand is to say, okay, well, if, and, and someone else, uh, John asked about this on, on LinkedIn, it's that if I look at what the constraint is, if I know, wow, if a, a lead to a leg, a lead is positive engagement, and I want to look at my bottleneck, then the key is what is my bottleneck to getting that positive response? Mm -hmm. What are the different ways I could generate a positive response? Like it could be a call to action. It could be a white paper. It could be a piece of content. It could be this or that. And so I think where we're moving with this kind of concept of revenue intelligence is to be able to start to identify the right leads to generate the right legs. And that sometimes the way that we might generate those leads might be different than times before. And it's not just more of the same activities. It's what went into that activities. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think the other thing related to that is the automation of it. So I think I think about the first of Insight Squared past our, our 10th, 10th birthday. So the first decade of Insight Squared was about, you know, putting the power of analytics into the user's hands rather than it being a centralized, you know, IT type of a thing. But that still required people to actively use it and to and to have the time. Uh, and to have the understanding. And of course, as I mentioned, it was based on limited data. I think that the next generation, and this is where I think revenue intelligence is really coming to the fore, is the stuff's gotta be, the stuff's gotta be automated. It's gotta, it's gotta present the, it's gotta present it to you. Like, hey, we have systematically identified, and this is where machine learning really comes in, that these are the patterns. Like you don't have to go, you don't have to go digging and fishing for it. Um, you know, the, there are fantastic statistical models that you can apply to, to generate those insights uh, and then make recommend, hey, what, what that investor asked me for, you know, seven years ago, it's like, hey, you should go do this now. Because that cognitive load of like having to figure all this stuff out prevents you like where I think where you want your quota bearing team focusing it is uh, that engagement, like when you're on with the customer you know the product, you're, you're empathetic, you're listening to their needs, you're figuring out if you could build a solution and drive them, drive them value. Th that's where you want your sellers focusing their energy, not around like, you know, what, what should I do next? Or, you know, how do, how do I think about my own pipeline and should I be prospecting or should I be, you know, working, working on this? Um, I think a really good parallel to that. So like, so uh, Tesla autopilot, right? So uh, I, I don't drive to the office anymore. I'm not sure I'll ever be uh, a com office commuter again. But when I was, like, I really hated driving because, uh, and I read about this, like all the little like micro adjustments that you do with the steering wheel and, 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 the, and the, the, the gas pedal, um, they put a huge cognitive load on you. So rather than like, uh, like when I took the train to the office, right. I love that because I, I did my thinking, you know, I could read a book, and I came home or came to the office like really refreshed and ready to go. Uh, driving was the exact opposite experience. And then, you know, I, I got a Model 3 and I put the thing on autopilot and generally it doesn't try to drive me into a ditch so I can trust it uh, most of the time. 
And all of a sudden that cognitive load was gone and I could focus on being sort of, you know, what, what, you know, be, being in the moment and thinking. I think the same thing, exact concept applies for sales reps. Like you want them doing what they shine at, which is engaging with, with the customers, not trying to figure out stuff that a system can, can figure out for them and make their life easier. So like removing the mundane and removing the stuff that, that's, that they're not, you know, it's not part of their core skill set, I think is what revenue intelligence should do. Yeah, it's got to pull it in. And, and kind of last set of questions here I want to ask are just around, you know, machine learning and AI, which you started to talk about, you know, so part of a revenue intelligence platform is just, and, you know, obviously the changes that, you know, you all have made in upgrading the platform over the years and why it's so awesome now is sucking in those data points, right? So I've got the data. You know, how is machine learning and AI coming into the game and what impact do you see it having on teams? And maybe talk a little bit about, you know, where you maybe some of the more common use cases today and, and what you think those use cases will be tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we've, we've touched on some of it already. At the core for machine learning, more data is more predictions, right? So if, if I can have more observ observable points of, of behavior, uh, I'm going to be able to give you better predictions, better recommendations. So for example, you know, we added conversational intelligence this year. So now we're able to, uh, you know, pull in all of the metadata from a call. Like I mentioned, relative talk time. Are you talking about certain keywords? Did you mention pricing, competition, th these types of things? So we're always thinking about as far as like where we're headed, what is the next uh, sort of corpus of data that we could br bring in to make our system more and more predictive? Uh, do we want to move up the funnel and, and figure out what people are doing on the web uh, to help uh, optimize around leads? Do we want to pull, pull in, you know, product and interaction data? So th I think that those that's where, where, we're, where we're headed, where you want to get more and more data into one system versus having a bunch of data in a bunch of systems where you can't necessarily marry it up together. Um, and again, to back to this point about the, the, the lines disappearing, like you're going to have to have all this data not just the teams cross-functional, but the data needs to be cross-functional as well. So I think that that's where we're where we're headed. And I, you know, I, I can't underscore enough. Like the, the only the only resource that you can't make more of is time. So our fo our focus is not just around like saving time, but focusing the time on uh, on on the revenue generating activities. So I think you know, can we help consistently help people figure out which of their pipeline is going nowhere? And look at the attributes uh, that, that drive that, and give and give them time to then focus on gen, on on working more closely, increasing the win rate of you know their ICPs, their ideal customer profiles, uh, or or generating more of the appropriate type of uh, of business. Yeah, and I think that that's where you know kind of phase two of this. I think we could do. I, I actually Todd Todd and I Todd Abbott, CEO of Insight Squared, and I did a webinar a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about we we touched on it, but I still like and now it's it's how does all this lead to the evolution of sales leadership? And, you know, if sales leadership's job before many times was to, you know, have a pipeline meeting with someone and it's very tactical and it's like, I'm pulling all these in information points out of you. And it's one person's opinion of what's happening on a deal, not a, uh, you know, a validated, even an accepted meeting invite or something like that, or responded to email. I think like for me, the next frontier becomes as sales leaders, how do we think about, um, adapting the way we think about even the, how you used to run your team. Yeah. You know, you used to run a pipeline meeting and how does that change it? So maybe just kind of final thoughts there, Fred, I'll throw it to you of just yeah. what do leaders need to do? What do in organizations to support this type of change to where we can stop moving, we can start to use the data and trust it versus continue to manage based on our own, you know, heuristics. Yeah, so I, you know, I, th I think two, two immediate response. Like if, if you're spending your meetings interrogating to gain information, that's exactly what we're talking about, wasting time, right? So that, yeah. that's, that, that's the mundane work that the system should automate and, and allow you to focus. Like, look, if, if Insight Squared's giving you a deal score of 95% and the deal's in commit, don't talk about it. Uh, if you're committing a deal where you haven't had engagement in two weeks, you should talk about it. And, and you need a system that helps you prioritize those conversations so you're not wasting your time interrogating on, on the mundane. That's 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 one part. I think to answer your other question about like what's the evolution of sales and what's the sales leader of the future going to look like, you know, I, I would recommend folks read about the industrial revolution. I'd recommend folks read about operations management as a practice, um, and 
you know, a couple of years ago, I said, this, this is coming. I feel like now it's here. The leading yeah. organizations uh, think, and, and it doesn't make people, uh, you know, automatons. Like that's not, that's not the goal. Like a lot of times people ask me, you know, is AI going to make sales go away? And like fundamentally, no, like sales is one of the most human of endeavors, right? It's about like connecting, building trust, understanding one another. Um, so the technology should be about pulling everything away other than those incredibly human activities. So I think the future of sales leadership is going to be setting up this, the organization like you would set up a factory floor and managing for quality control and doing inspection and running things by the numbers so that the people who are operating in it are free of all distraction other than doing what they're best at. I love that. And, and the good part is that is a, it's always been that way. That's always been the job of, of sales leadership, but because we haven't had the, the tools, et cetera, it's almost, we had to get, you know, at times people had to get into the minutia, whether right or wrong to try to understand, okay, so how is so-and-so packaging this box? Yeah, or, the, the big yeah. change is that the, the data is now The data is easier. Now, the, yeah. the, the concept was always there. Now you can actually implement it. Exactly. So, all right, everyone. We have, I mean, Fred, we had a lot of people join. So between LinkedIn and Zoom, we had, shoot, maybe 50, 60 folks joining us to talk about rev ops and sales ops. Uh, pretty easy. So um, I think over the course of it, we've had, I'll tell you, actually, it's more than that. It's maybe a hundred or so people who stopped by for some point. So I think this is a topic we're going to continue to talk about. Obviously, if you all don't know Insight Squared, um, I would just encourage all of you to just, again, the art of possible right now is at an amazing high. I mean, obviously it will continue to be right since the art of possible, but the things that inside squared is doing right now to, um, and I'm not getting pre Fred isn't, this isn't a, a paid promotion here. Um, the, the things that it's able to automate and really simplify to allow your team to run more effectively and for leaders to lead more effectively is truly what I, you know, I think is, is best in class. And so, um, this whole conversation is going to, you know, we're going to continue to have these conversations. We're going to continue to start to think about rev ops and sales ops as a insights factory versus a data factory, because now we have tools that can provide revenue intelligence uh, for us as well. Um, and if you like, go ahead and check out, we dropped this um, revenue. It's basically our zero to 20 playbook. I'm just going to drop it in here for everybody. Um, <clears throat> that really just talks about all the different challenges that you're going to face too as you scale. So it's a pretty great piece of content that we put together. Go check out what Fred and the team at Insight Squared are doing. And thank you, everyone. F thank you, Fred, for joining me. It's fun to catch up, man. We'll catch up. We'll, we're going to catch up uh, maybe on, after the fourth. We'll talk about Lake Life. And we'll awesome. talk about how, how that's going, man. But I'm, I'm excited for you and excited for the trajectory at Insight Squared. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in both on Zoom and on LinkedIn. And we will see you all next Monday. Have a great rest of your week. Finish the month, the quarter strong. We'll see you then. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, everyone.